morning, everyone. Welcome to the IVS seminar, to the new location. So it's going to be our room for the rest of the uh, academic year, I believe. So uh, it's good that you found your way. Uh, so the, the seminar of today will be given by Yolene. She is a PhD uh, student with us in Lenz Group. Uh, she did her bachelor at Kulak in Kortrijk, and then she, she moved to uh, IVS for her master studies. Uh, it was quite interesting to learn that uh, Yolene, uh, she likes dancing a lot, and she's a step instructor. So if you, if you like uh, stepping, and uh, you know, <laughs> feel free to join her classes. Yeah, she, I'm pretty sure she will be happy to teach you some yes. of that stuff. But today she will talk a bit about uh, AGB outflows and what uh, stellar companions, or maybe planetary uh, mass companions, I don't know, uh, have to do with that. Okay, Yulene, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, so, I will tell you a bit more about how AGB outflows are shaped by wind companion interactions. I did not include planets, but if you want to know about them, we can tell you later because we also have some models of planets. So, it's going to be about stars. Um, I'll also tell you a bit more in general what our team is working on, so also what my collaborators are doing and which goal we try to reach by working together. So, short recap about AGB stars. So, AGB stars are evolved low and intermediate mass stars with initial masses in between 0 0.8 and 8 solar masses. Um, and when they evolve towards the AGB branch, as you can see on the HR diagram, they become a bit more luminous and they are very large compared to their initial um, stage. What is important about AGB stars is that they have pulsation enhanced dust driven winds. So they shed out their outer layers thru, uh, throughout this AGB stage. And in this way, they enrich the interstellar medium with a lot of dust and gas, which, made, which makes them very important to study. So here you see a bit an overview of what this AGB outflow schematically looks like. Um, so you have a CO core, then the inner winds, um, in which there are pulsation shocks that levitate material up to higher atmospheres where it is cooler and in this way you get a higher density there and dust can form. And this dust is very important to be able to drive the wind then as this dust um, is driven by the stellar radiation and then couples to the gas and in this way the wind is launched. Um, as you can also see a bit here on the, at the bottom, there is a big range in density and temperature throughout these winds, and this makes that these winds are um, very astrochemically rich, because you have all these different densities and temperatures, you can make different molecules, and uh, this makes these stars chemical laboratories. The um, wind velocities, the thermal wind velocities, range in between about 5 to 30 km per second. So this is quite fast, but compared to massive stars, these are slow winds. And the massless rates range in between 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 5 or 4 solar masses per year. So the reason we really have to understand these winds and study them is because of their chemical enrichment into the interstellar medium. So if you want to understand the chemical evolution of the galaxy and where all the materials come from, we have to understand these winds. So for decades, it was assumed that these winds were spherically symmetric, as a star is spherically symmetric. But we're not sure anymore that this is actually the case. Because as you can see here on some um, relatively older observations, is that some of these AGB stars were found to have an approximate Archimedes spiral structure in their wind. And this Archimedes spiral structure is also known to form automatically when you have a companion star that is orbiting around the evolved star, as was studied already in 1999 by Masro Demus and Morris in some simple uh, hydrodynamic simulations. So, inspired by these things, the team of Lane with the Atomium Consortium decided to ask for an um, Alma Large program to study these AGB outflows in more detail. And what we see, as you can see, on these examples, is that these outflows are not spherically symmetric, but harbor a lot of complex structures, ranging from spiral-like things, arcs, bipolarity, disks. Um, so if you want to understand what, is, um, what you can see here, these are 
uh, observation of the CO2 to 1 line. It's not that important, but um, you can see the material in the wind and everything that is colored red is coming uh, is going away from you. Everything that is colored blue is coming towards you. So it's the, the full wind projected on top of each other. And then you can see that, for example, in Pi 1 grow, there is a rotating structure as part of the wind is coming towards you, part is going away from you. And here you also see some bipolar-like structures. So there's a large variety of complex things going on in these winds. By now, it is commonly believed that one of the primary causes of a lot of these structures is the interaction of the wind with one or multiple stellar or planetary companions that often remain hidden within these outflows. That is not difficult to believe if you look at population synthesis. So here you see a graph that shows on top the multiplicity and uh, the bottom row is triple and higher order fractions. So if you look at a solar mass star, you can see that about 50% has a companion and even about 13% has two companions. So this should not be ignored, of course. We also have some indirect observations that show that indeed there are companions shaping these outflows. And then, of course, we have this large study of hydro simulations where we also see that indeed, if you add a companion, you can create a lot of complex um, structures that resemble these observations. And that is mostly where I'm going to be talking about. So knowing that these winds are not spherically symmetric gives us some challenges or opportunities. So at first, we see that using these 1D approaches in the past, this may have led to some incorrect conclusions. So for example, the AGB mass loss rate is something that we're really not sure about if the things we are currently using are actually correct or if there is um, some systematic mistakes on there. Because if you interpret these winds as being 1D and you um, calculate the mass loss rate from the observations, but it's actually not a 1D thing and there's different things going on, you might make mistakes. And also the companion might just impact the intrinsic mass loss rate of the star. So there's a lot of uncertainties there. Um, this is something that our master student Owen is going to do a PhD about, so we hope to solve this problem a bit using our hydrodynamic simulations. Then we can also try to bridge the gap with post-AGB stars and planetary nebula, because these come after the AGB uh, stage. This is a plot you have shown already in the seminar by Ton, and it's made by Hans. So there are still some problems in understanding the orbital evolution towards the post-AGB phase. So what you see here in um, yeah, all the colored symbols are observations of post-AGB binaries. So not only the post-AGB stars we typically talk about in Team Hans, but also all systems that just have a star that comes after the AGB phase. And then you can compare this to population synthesis results, so what we know of the theory, theory. And you can see that both the periods and the eccentricities are totally not what we expect. So this is still a big gap in our knowledge of how these systems um, come to be. Um, and we hope that if we study the AGB phase a bit better, we can also get some knowledge about how these systems actually arise after this AGB phase. And then we also still have all these complex structured morphologies of which we already know for a long time that they are there in the planetary nebula and the post-AGB stars. And for example, these from the post-AGB um, are currently well studied in the team of Hans, and I think they understand quite well what it looks like, but how it is formed is still a mystery. So that is also something that we hope that by understanding the AGB binaries better, we might see some signs of how these structures actually arise. So here you see a comparison of known planetary nebula that host binary central stars. And if you put them next to the atomium observations, it's not a one-to-one -one, um, resemblance, but at least you see that there is some sign that similar things might create these morphologies. So there might be a link, and we should use our knowledge uh, combined to understand these two phases. So then the third challenge we have is that now we have all these observations, high re resolution observations of the AGB outflows, and we should try to understand them intrinsically better. And this is what we are mostly doing in the Atomium collaboration. 
So this is an overview slide of what we are working on, so the people I, I collaborate uh, with most closely. So on the left you have the Atomium Consortium, so these are mostly observers, and they work on understanding how, which molecules there are in the winds from just uh, interpreting the observations. Then you have on the right side the AGB wind models, so the hydrodynamic theoretical modeling. This is done with the code Phantom, which is developed by Lionel Price and by Lionel Cis. And this is mostly me and Mats, and now also Owen, our master student, that are working on this. And then we also want to bridge this gap between these pure theoretical models and the observations, because we want to understand what is happening in these observations by study studying or hydro models. And for that, we need a relative transfer. So this is the bridge. Uh, and we use the code MyGrids that is developed by uh, Thomas and Frederik. But I'll go into um, all the parts a bit more, and I'll start with the HB wind models, so the hydro observations. Also, I forgot to say, if you have questions, so if there's something you don't understand or you need immediate action, please just, just ask. I don't mind being interrupted, and then larger questions can come at the end, though. So everyone is still OK? Good. So the AGB wind model. We use an SPH code, so smoothed particle hydrodynamics, so not grid-based like AMR back. Um, and the code is called Phantom. So what happens in our code is that you have a gravity-only AGB star and compa companion sink particles. So these are not, we don't model these stars, we just add a sink particle that can accrete mass, um, but they are not radiating or anything, it's just sink particles. And then we launch a wind of SPH gas particles from around the radius of our AGB star. So in concentric shells, we send out these particles randomly distributed on these spheres, so that you don't get structures from just sending out particles. And um, these are SPH gas particles, so no dust is included yet in our models. Um, and then the wind is launched by just giving them an initial wind velocity. And we use a free wind model, which means that we neglect the AGB star's gravity. And in this way, the, companion particle, uh, the gas particles can more easily escape. Because it's difficult to launch the wind in a fully physical way, because you need this dust, you need these pulsations. And that is not that easy yet. So currently, in my models, we use a free wind. But we are still working on improving these models. Um, so this is something that Mats, together with Lionel, is, uh, has been working on and will be working on. So what he did is already study different ways to launch the wind in a more physical way. So not just the free wind, where you just accelerate a bit and the wind is launched, but actually doing it more in a physical way, in such a way that the wind can only be accelerated from the moment onwards where dust can form. So this is already a way to do it a bit better. And he. Um, he did it by also implementing some sort of radiation force. And these are the results from, from what he did. So you can read his paper if you uh, want to know more about this. Then Lionel is also working on the inclusion of uh, dust nucleation. And we really want to include pulsations, but this hasn't been done yet or hasn't worked out yet since. So this is working? Yeah, OK. Um, so we want to include more accurate cooling and heating, because that's also, it's, it's also not an easy thing to do. Um, but it, yeah, of course, it's also important. But currently, we already have one form of cooling, atomic line cooling. Because in my first paper, we didn't have this yet. And then we got some slightly unphysical things, because the region around the companion was heating up a lot. And that was not. Correct, so you got weird outflows. So we included this atomic line cooling because that cooling works quite efficiently in the region where we had these unphysical things. So this makes the simulations already more physical. But of course, in the future, adding more and more physics will help. But by just building up slowly, we hope to understand everything really well and understand the effects of all these things to get to a, a good knowledge. Because if you include everything at first, you just don't know what is 
affecting what. Okay, so this is the model we are using. So now I'll go a bit deeper into what we already know from our simulations. Okay, so in general, the impact of the companion as it interacts with the wind is twofold. So at first, because there is a companion, your AGB star is also moving, and because you have this induced orbital motion, you already tend to create a spiral structure. And then, as the companion is orbiting around this AGB star, it is also gravitationally interacting with the wind particles, and as it attracts wind particles around it, and it's also moving, you also tend to create a spiral structure. So these two effects work together, and then as you can see here, you get spiral structures, approximate Archimedes spiral structures in the wind outflow. So in general, the impact of a companion will be stronger when its mass is larger, because the orbital motion of the AGB star will be larger, and it can also uh, gravitationally interact with the wind particles more stronger. Then the impact will also be stronger if your orbital separation, so your major axis, is smaller because it's closer to the AGB star, so with the same effects as for the larger mass of the companion. Then if you lower the wind velocity, you take away some of the kinetic energy of the wind, and then the ratio of the kinetic energy to um, yeah, the, the impact of the gravitational energy of the companion will be lower. Okay, I'll say it differently. Because it has less energy, it can less easily escape the companion, so it will be trapped around the companion more easily, so you also get a stronger interaction of the companion with the wind. And then we can also change the orbital eccentricity, and as you might expect, this will complicate things a lot. I will show you in the second part. Okay, so in uh, our models, of the models that, that I will show now, this is the setup of our binary systems. So we have a 1.5 solar mass AGB star with a solar mass companion that is at an orbital separation of six astronomical units. Um, I will change the eccentricity from zero to 0 0.5. The wind velocity will be changed to study this change in wind companion interaction intensity. And we have a mass rate of 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year. So this is um, the orbital plane. This is our full model, and in most of the plots I will show, you will just see this slice of the orbital plane. So it's a slice through our 3D model. Okay, so here you see two of the binary models. So one is with a high wind velocity, one is with an intermediate wind velocity. So this means that in this case, the impact of the companion will be stronger because the wind can less easily escape the companion. And you see that in this orbital plane slice, in both cases, you get an approximate Archimedes spiral. So you see here the density in the slice through the orbital plane. Then we can turn around our view. So instead of looking at the orbital plane, we see an edge-on view. So it's again a slice perpendicular on this orbital plane. We see again the density of the same two models. Um, in the previous slide, there was both an approximate Archimedes spiral. They were pretty similar. But then if you look in the edge-on view, you can see that these models are not the same at all. So the structures differ quite strongly. Um, so what you see is actually the height of these spirals. And in this case, these spirals have some sort of concentric, so the center of the bananas at the both sides is in the center of the image. So banana-shaped arcs, and here you have more rings that are also elongated. So here the wind velocity does make a big difference in what these structures look like. And these bicentric rings originate because of this lower wind velocity and because of the orbital motion of the AGB star. So because you have this orbital motion, there is a centrifugal force. And 
that makes that if you have just the normal wind velocity and HB star would not be moving, you would get a spherically symmetric wind. Uh, winds, but because it's moving, there is an additional wind velocity factor in the region, uh, in the sides of the orbital plane. So in this way, your structures become a bit elongated because you have this additional factor in this direction. So the, um, the stronger this difference in the wind velocity in the orbital plane, the stronger this effect will be. So the lower the wind velocity, the st stronger the effect of this orbital wind velocity, and the more we expect there to be this flattening or elongation in the wind. So that's why in the previous uh, thing, if you have the higher wind velocity, you got these arcs that were concentric, but now you get this elongation because of the lower wind velocity. Okay, so we go back to the orbital plane view. So these approximate Archimedes spirals at first sight look alike, but if you zoom in, you will see that there is actually a difference between the two. So if you have a high wind velocity, you get the most simple case. And you see that there is one spiral structure with two edges behind the companion. So as the companion is gravitationally attracting material, this material will be behind the companion as it is moving. But because there is a velocity dispersion in, uh, yeah, in this material, this spiral is widening. So material that is moving really outward faster will be at this outer edge. If it's moving really outward less fast, it will be at this inner edge. And then in the second case, you don't get this two edge spiral, but you get one flow here closely um, around the AGB star. And then you get a second flow that is a bow shock spiral that also has this inner and outer edge again because of this velocity dispersion. Okay, everyone's still following? Good. So if we zoom in even more closely, we also see that in this case, where is, there is a bow shock. A lot of material is accumulated closely around this companion, creating a very high density region there. This is the region where everything went a bit weird in my first paper because we didn't have this H1 cooling. But now that we have this H1 cooling, material here is cooled down enough that actually an accretion disk is able to form. So in my upcoming paper, we study these accretion disks in more detail. So here you see the orbital plane slice through this accretion disk and the edge on slice through the secretion disk. So you can see that there is a flaring disk. And in the orbital plane, it's quite round. And the velocity vectors are plot on top. And you can see that material is orbiting in this disk towards the companion. So what we found by studying these accretion disks in more detail is that, in general, there are two types of disks that can form. So the first type is the one that we see if the wind velocity is rather low. In this case, you know that a lot of material is accumulated around the companion because of this stronger gravitational interaction. And we also know that, in general, a bow shock will form. And these two things together make that this accretion disk can grow quite large because there is a lot of material and because this bow shock is sort of protecting the accretion disk from direct interaction with the outflowing wind. So in these cases, we have a quite large um, accretion disk. Um, and here you see the, the flaring of the disk. And what we also see in these cases is that inside the disk there are two spiral-like features. So I indicated them here. It's maybe a bit difficult for you to see. This is the same image. So one is here, and then the other one is always a bit more difficult to see. It goes here. So one goes to the bow shock in front. One goes to the flow that is closely around the AGB star. And this is something that was also already seen in previous studies by Lee et al., which also studied um, a bit similar um, accretion disks in these hydro simulations. So then the second case is if the wind velocity is high. We don't have this bow shock, um, and the companion interacts less, less strongly with the wind particles, so you have a much smaller accretion disk. You don't see these two spirals, so this is the more simple, smaller case. But it's still a flaring disk and still material orbiting uh, inwards to the companion. Okay, so if we study the velocity profile within these disks, here you see again the orbital plane slice and you see the tangential velocity um, with respect to the companion. So the companion is here at um, uh, coordinates zero and it has a zero velocity. 
And then you can see that these tangential velocities are quite high, so material is orbiting around the zinc particle with quite large velocities. And if you compare it to a Ka Keplerian velocity law in function of the radius, it matches quite well. So we have a Keplerian velocity field within these disks. It becomes sub-Keplerian when you go more to the outer sides of the disks. Okay, so this is maybe a bit technical. I won't explain it in too much detail, but we um, estimated the disk mass, the disk radius, and the scale heights of the disk to get some quantification and be able to compare what happens with the disk mass, disk radius, when you lower the wind velocity. Um, so to do this, we um, used this vertical density profile in theoretical studies of disks, and this defines what the scale height is in a disk. So here, the scale height, is if you start from the orbital plane and you go up for one specific radius, then you say that you reach the scale height when the density has dropped with about 0.6, and you reach two times the scale height when the density has dropped with about 0.14. So this comes from this formula. So in this way, we estimate what the scale height is at every radius going outward in the disk. And then we also use this to calculate um, an estimate of the mass. So we iterate over the radius, so we go outward in the disk, and at every iteration step, we estimate the mass that is inside this radius and inside the scale height, and then we, um, we sum up the mass for all the previous steps. So this is a bit um, what happens here is the, the center. And then we estimate the radius as the radius where the increase of this mask becomes um, small enough that we can say, okay, now we're outside the disk because the mass increase um, becomes negligible. Okay, so here are the results of this. So first you see the table. So what you see is that if we increase the wind velocity, the radius of our disks becomes smaller. So this is also what we can understand and what we expect from um, that there is no bow shock anymore and the interaction with the wind is uh, less strong. You also see that the disk mass is decreasing and the scale height is decreasing. So this is all a bit what we expect, so good. Um, also, the disk mass is much, much smaller than the companion mass, which just means that there won't be any planets forming in this disk. This is still a small disk, no planet formation around this um, companion. Uh, what you see in these plots is the increase of the mass in function of time in our simulations. So you can see that the disk is first still growing, but we have reached the point where the disk mass is stable. And then in the second graph, you see the uh, radius and then the scale height divided over r. This is a tool that they generally also used to say if the disk is flaring or if it's flat. So you can see that it's a flaring disk because we have this increase here. Okay, so then um, our disks are not nicely symmetric. We never have spherical symmetry here. Um, we can study this by dividing up our disk into four different regions. So this is what we do here. So you see four different regions. And then we can, again, calculate the scale heights, the mass, and things like that in these four different regions. And here you see an example of the scale heights in these four different regions and four different colors. So you can see that at a different angle, you get at this time a much higher scale height than at this side. So no spherically symmetric disks. Um, so yeah, if, if you want to know more in detail about this, I can tell you and you can read the paper. Um, but the main thing is just that they are not spherically symmetric, which also makes sense because you have this bow shock at this side, this uh, second flow at this side, which has an impact on the structure of the disk. Okay, so um, then we also study the eccentric binaries. This is important because we know that post AGB stars often are in eccentric orbits. Um, and we also have already some AGB stars of which we think that they have a companion in an eccentric orbit. But this complicates everything because throughout one orbital period, you have a strong variation in the orbital separation and in the orbital velocities of the stars, which has an impact on how strongly the companion interacts with the wind. So you get this uh, phase-dependent wind-companion interaction intensity, which will make sure you don't have this nice um, Archimedes-like spiral. So 
This is an example where you have a high wind velocity and an orbital eccentricity. So you see again density in the orbital plane slice, density in the edge on plane slice. So this still remember, uh, resembles quite well in uh, spiral structures, but you get some asymmetries because of these eccentric orbits. So some um, typical things that we see is that at this side there are low density gaps. So here you see that structures overlap each other, while here it takes a longer time before spirals catch up with each other, which creates these low density gaps in between the, the spiral structures, the two-edged spiral structures. You also see them again in the edge-on view. Um, so this is something that if we look at observations, we can try to see, if we see these characteristics, to tell that it might be an eccentric system. And another thing is that the regions where you have this overlap, uh, um, yeah, where you go from a low density gap to these overlapping regions, you see bifurcations, which are regions where two structures seem to split up or come together. So this is another thing we can look for in the observations. So here you see an animation of how these structures form to get an, give you a bit of an idea, because it's sometimes difficult if you see the standing picture. So you can see a bit that the companion at Apastron site is going quite slowly, quite far, and then at Perastron site, it's close by, but it also moves very fast. So in this way, you get all these different structures. Again, in my first paper, I um, describe in quite high detail how you get all these different structures. So if you're interested, you can talk to me or look there. Uh, okay, so then, if you lower the wind velocity, the structures start to deviate much more from this um, asymmetric spiral structures. So instead of a spiral, you get some more complex structures. The structures are still recurrent every orbital period, so it is a stable uh, configuration. It's self-similar morphology. Every orbital period, the same thing happens. But what is actually happening is much more complex. So here you see uh, a zoomed-in uh, density movie. So again, at this side, companion is at Periastrum passage, so it's going very fast. Here it's very slow, but it's also further away from the companion. And uh, this creates quite complex mechanisms going on. So uh, one thing is that it will, like here you have some sort of a bow shock more, while it's at this region, it starts to move faster and you get something that will resemble more this two-edged spiral because the bow shock is not that large. But next to this variation in these structures, you also see that the companion is also um, colliding with previous density structures and this also complicates what is happening. So this is one example of such an eccentric low velocity system, but these morphologies can really differ a lot, just depending if you, if you change a little thing, like the wind velocity you might get uh, different structures. But what you maybe noticed already is that throughout the full orbital period, although it's really complex, um, there's still always an accretion disk forming uh, uh, present around the companion. So we also studied these accretion disks in these eccentric simulations. And the main takeaway here is that maybe as you expected, as the um, structures around the companion differ a lot, the um, uh, accretion disk is also changing quite a lot throughout every orbital period. Um, so that depends again on how strong the wind companion interaction is, but also strongly on if this accretion disk is colliding with previous density structures, this has an impact on this accretion disk. So, but the main takeaway is that the, you see the radius is changing, the mass is changing, scale height is changing. In this case, you have these two spiral structures within the wind, but here it's just an asymmetric disk, so it's also quite complex. Then uh, we also study the mass accretion through this accretion disk in our simulations. So here you see what would the theoretically be expected for a bondi hauer mass of rate. So this is just a way to get a theoretical estimate. And then this is what we calculated in our simulations. So it's the mean over like an orbital period. Um, you see that they are quite alike. This is not immediately what we would expect for lower velocity models, but 
yeah, we'll have to think about that. Um, and here you see also that in these eccentric systems, this mass accretion throughout one orbital period differs a lot if you are an apastron or periastron passage. So the, um, the dotted lines are periastron passage, so where the companion is close to the AGB star. And in this case, we have these peaks in mass accretion which kind of makes sense because the companion is so close to the AGB star, it resides in a higher density region, so there are just more particles that can be accreted. And then you have this extra bump here. That bumps, bump is there because at that time, the accretion disk is colliding with such a previous density structure, and then it can also accrete some more mass. So this is a general trend that we see in these eccentric simulations. Okay, then um, we also like to collaborate with observers to model actual observations and not just theoretically understand what is going on. So this is an example of a collaboration with Taisa Danilovic, uh, who was here some years ago still, and now she's at Monash University in Melbourne. Um, so here you see an example of a very eccentric a uh, binary in a large orbital separation, so 125 AU is very large for our simulation, so this one took really long, but it was worth it. Um, and you see that because of this really high eccentricity, you get some concentric shapes in these outflows. And this is also what she found already in her observations. So here you see a channel map, so yeah, observation material of a certain molecule, and there she already identified that there were some concentric structures, and then we, when we made the simulation, this also um, yeah, made sense. Uh, and in this way, our simulations helped her to confirm that what she thought about this orbital separation, this high eccentricity, made sense, because it's also what we find here. So we helped her to confirm that her results were correct and that there was a certain companion at this certain orbit. It's also something, I didn't work on this paper or anything, but it was nice to see that uh, with the James Webb they also had this image of this wolf ray star that was also known to be in a very eccentric orbit, and you see again this kind of concentric shapes, so this confirms that indeed if you have these high eccentricities you get these concentric shapes. These concentric shapes mostly form because the orbit of the AGB is also very eccentric, so at periastron passage it changes direction really on a very short time scale, so the velocity changes, and in this way you get these concentric shapes. Okay, and then I'm also studying what happens in case you have a triple system. Um, I focus on the most simple systems, which are hierarchical triple systems, and they are co-planners, so I don't do the more complex systems yet. Um, so what we have is always an inner binary, so you have the AGB star with a companion that is quite close, and then you have an additional companion that is further away. Because of this additional companion, this inner binary is also orbiting around the common center of mass of the full system, and this will complicate the outflows already of this AGB star. So in our cases, the inner orbital separation is 5 AU. AGB star has a mass of 1.6 solar masses with a companion of 0 0.4 solar masses. So if you would just have this binary system, it would be a quite simple spiral because the mass of the companion is quite low. Uh, and then the additional companion is at 35 AU. Um, and we vary the mass, the eccentricity, uh, and the wind velocity of the system. Okay, so this is one simulation density in the orbital plane. This is just zoomed in more to see the inner system, zoomed out more to see the full system. So what you see in general is that in the inner system we have this nice two-edged spiral structure, and then this uh, additional companion creates also an additional structure on top of this inner, um, this inner density spiral. This additional spiral is quite broad, and it also um, has some waves, as you can see here, because it's interacting all the time with these inner spiral structures. So this inner spiral is strongly affecting this outer spiral. If you would only have this outer companion, not the inner companion, this would be just a thin 
more boring spiral structure. So this is what you generally see in um, these triple simulations. Okay. So this is again the same simulation you just saw, but more than that. But then if we increase the mass of the outer companion, another effect becomes more clear. I don't know if it's good enough for you to see, but because this inner binary, so the AGB star and the inner companion, is strongly orbiting around the common center of mass, the, the quite dense spiral structure that is formed around this inner binary is also orbiting around the center of mass. So in this way, instead of a nice Archimedes spiral, the spiral is pushed forward a bit and you get some sort of a, a snail shell pattern. So I don't know if you can see it, but it's like the circles are also sort of moving. So these are the two things that are typical for these triple simulations. Ah, one more movie. So this is just another example. This is just my favorite one. I think it's really beautiful. So you have this broad extra um, triple spiral structure. And what you can also see clearly here is that the although the inner binary is a really dense spiral, this outer spiral structure becomes dominant at larger scales. So the inner structure is only visible really at the inner side of the system. And then in general, you just see the, this tertiary spiral. So again, in observations, this might be something to look for. If you see that at larger scales, it's just like one big spiral, but at inner scales, you see additional spirals. It might be a triple system. Okay, so I'll continue on what we are working on. So I talked about the AGB wind models, then I'll shortly highlight what Silke is doing. So um, I didn't talk about any chemical things yet because that is not included in my simulation. So we just have gas, we just have particles. Uh, we don't really calculate uh, a chemical network, but we really want to include that. And that is what Silke is working on. She's speeding up this chemical calculation to make it feasible to actually include it in her 3D models. So as I said in the beginning, this is really important because we want to understand how these AGB outflows are enriching the um, interstellar medium. But if we just do everything in one dimensional, we miss all these density structures that are forming and that also will impact the chemistry. So we really want to couple these chemical calculations with our 3D hydrodynamic models. But this is uh, not that easy because the chemical network is very, very large, there's a lot of species, a lot of reactions. And if you want to solve that, you have to solve a huge set of coupled differential equations. And this becomes infeasible if you try to do that with our 3D hydrodynamic models. So Silke uh, took a different route to solve this and to accelerate this. Um, and she did it with the use of machine learning. So here you see a schematic view of what her code maze is doing. So as an input, the code gets the physical state and the abundances. And then we try to calculate the abundances at a later time. So at the time plus delta t. So to be able to do this, this is a very large parameter set. We have to encode this set to get a smaller parameter set on which we can actually um, calculate the uh, differential equations. So you encode this to get to a latent space, which means you don't have a physical parameters anymore. anymore. This is just a mathematical thing. And then you decode this again once you have the results to get back to the large parameter space and get the abundances. So this is only possible, of course, with machine learning. Um, but as you can see here, some of, her for, uh, some of her recent results are that it actually works. So she managed to, uh, to do this and to train her code to be able to uh, get these abundances. So the input parameters are here with on the top. So you see that the density is varying uh, over the radius. So this is the full outflow. The uh, density drops, the temperature drops, and with these input parameters, she can uh, already with MACE calculate what the abundances will be throughout the outflow. So here you see the results of MACE and what you get just from a classical calculation. And you see that they manage to, uh, yeah, to calculate this really well. But Silke will tell you more if you want to know about this. Then 
Next. So our ultimate goal is that we, yes? Ah, oh, sorry, I thought there was a question already. Good. So the ultimate goal is that we want to uh, be able to learn something about these observations from our simulations, what we already managed to do in this example of a W. Achille with Taisa. But in general, we want to do this with the use of relative transfer. And um, as I said, Frederick and Thomas developed the code Magritte that can do this. So um, Magritte is an open source software library for these 3D models, and we can use it, of course, on our phantom models really well. So it's line relative transfer. It can do non-LTE. Scattering and rest are not yet included. And it's MPN open MP parallel. So um, it doesn't uh, require an input grid, so you can do it both on SPH models and on uh, grid-based models. And then it optimizes discretization, so it does a remeshing algorithm to um, make sure that you don't need all the points we have in our models, but it's in a more optimal way. Uh, and then it traces race, so it's a ray tracing algorithm. Um, this is also a ray tracer that uh, Mats used then in Phantom to do things. So if you're interested in all these things, you can get like nice things from Magritte to use in other codes. But again, uh, Thomas and Frederick will be glad to tell you more if you're interested in this. So here you see an example of how we can use this. These are the observations of the star R. Achille from the atomium sample. Um, so these are channel maps. So this means that these are 2D images. And on each image, you see material that is coming towards you or going away from you with this specific velocity that is in the top corner. So you can go through these images in this way, and then you get already a little bit an idea of the 3D um, morphology of this star. So you see that it's a really complex star. It's not just spirals, or there's no disk, no bipolar outflows, no rotation. Um, so these are the kind of systems that are still really <laughs> difficult to interpret what is actually going on. But then with Magritte, we can create these synthetic observables of, this is a one an example of a triple simulation. And then we are actually able to compare what we get from these observations to our simulations. Of course, in the perfect world, we would be, be, would be able to actually compare these two. In reality, it's still really difficult because uh, it's not possible to include all physics that you have in real, uh, real life, so in observations in our models. Um, so this will never be a one-to-one -one comparison. And then it's also really difficult if you have observations like this to get an idea of what would be the system that we can model to get something that looks like this observation. So this is really difficult to do. And that is why Frederick is working or has um, developed a code that does the reverse. So Magritte is doing forward modeling, so what I just showed. But then if you want to do the inverse, you can try to go from an observation to a simulation, which is the thing we, we cannot do if we just look at the observation with our eyes. So you have reality, and then you have the observation. We already lose some information here, because the observations we have are these channel maps, which are 2D images in which you know the x and y coordinates, but you don't know the z coordinates. So you don't know how deep you are looking. What you know is the uh, projected velocity VZ, so you know if it's coming towards you or going away from you. But we also don't know the exact velocity fields of our winds. So this is still not easy to get a 3D image of this, because you don't know what the Z-coordinate is. And this is something that um, Frederick's new code, POM, is able to do. So here you see already one example of such a thing. So it's again the star R. Achille that you saw in the, in the previous slides. And here you see that he managed to actually make this 3D image of the observations with this uh, new code, POM. So uh, we will use POM in the future a lot, hopefully, <laughs> to um, be able to get this link better between our observations and simulations. Okay, so I hope you now have a bit a good overview of what we are all working on and how we try to reach our goal together of understanding these observations with the use of our theoretical work on these simulations. So to conclude, AGB, post-AGB, and planetary nebula are really complex systems, um, and often there will be companions that shape these systems. 
But with our uh, hydro models, we are already um, doing well on uh, understanding how these binary triple systems can create structures in these winds. But we still want to improve our AGB model and couple it with chemistry to be able to uh, develop better things and get better results. And then uh, we hope to make this link between these simulations and observations using Magritte and POM, the uh, inverse thing. So thank you very much. If you have questions, you can go. Thanks, Jolien, for a very interesting talk. We could run a fun exercise where I would be running forth and back, up and down, you know, with the microphone, but I guess I'll just try to glue you to this desk yes. with this microphone. Time for questions. Yep. Thank you, Jolien. Uh, two small questions. What happens to the accretion disk when you stop your wind? I didn't do that, but I guess it will fade. Um, maybe, I don't know. Maybe just something to, I'm just curious to know. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. How long, does it survive? Uh, what does it need? I would think but it will fade out if, the, if you get like emptiness around it because of the pressure. But gravitation the company might hold it together. But, but yeah, I don't know, I haven't tested it. Yeah. Then I know it's probably not feasible at this point, but does your code give you any hints on how you make this circumbinary disk in the post-AGB, or are you lacking too much physics and dust physics yeah. to do this? I think we're lacking physics also. Uh, like we, do, we don't include radiation now, so you don't get these optical depths and stuff. So the only thing we see that resembles it a bit is this, um, if you have this flattening already, that it's becoming a little bit more disk-like. And we also see sometimes more in the inner wind that you get an equatorial density enhancement, but it's much, much smaller than what you get in these post-AGB systems. But at least we already have the accretion disk around the companion. So what we also miss then is the bipolar outflows that they see from these accretion disks in these post-AGB stars. Um, but uh, as Ton, I don't know if you see, he, he said that uh, you will need magnetic, uh, yeah, yeah, we need magnetic fields to be able to get to launch these jets. So that is also something that we, we don't have yet. So we, it's not one that we don't get these jets, but they might arise if we would include uh, magnetic fields. Thanks for the talk, uh, <laughs> <laughs> So um, what I understand from the simulations in the first part of your talk is when you have a higher eccentricity, so your 0.5 uh, yes. simulation, you introduce this asymmetry in your spiral structure, right? Yes. And then um, we go to W equally, yes. <laughs> where you have a super high eccentricity of 0 0.95, yes. and you have these concentric circles which look very symmetric. Yes. So what are the other um, factors in your simulations which introduce or take away the asymmetries? It's, um, let's see if I can back to this. Yeah, so the main thing is that if, you, if your eccentricity is like around 0 0.5, oh, sorry, microphone. So if it's around 0 0.5, you all the time still have quite a strong wind companion interaction but it just changes a lot during the orbit. So if it's at, if your companion is at Apastron, you still like make a lot of structures around the companion because it's still quite close. But in these really large um, orbital separations, together with this eccentricity, if you're at Apastron, the companion is so far away that not a lot of things are happening. So the, you still see that there is an, um, like a two-edged spiral structure forming. So here it's far away and then it comes closer towards the companion and you get this two-edged, it's not a spiral anymore because it's going almost straight towards the companion. And then the interaction around um, the companion and the AGB star is really strong but really short at this periostrum passage. So it's only close to the AGB for a relatively short time and that is when this concentric shape is formed during this really short, close interaction. So in this way, this eccentricity just makes that you have one short interaction and then the other one is just more boring, these two edge things. So that is why you lose some sort of this global asymmetry. Thank you. Okay. 
Time for more questions. Um, this accretion disk you get around the secondary, mm -hmm. the density you showed quite nicely. Do you have temperature estimate on that as well, or is that not doable? The, you mean lots of the temperature? Yes. Yes. I didn't include it. In it. It's, it will be in my paper. Uh, ah, okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's also because I had to recalculate my models because there was something wrong with the cooling. So most things are updated if there was a big change, but something that's still the, the old things if there wasn't a big change. But the temperature has changed quite a lot. Um, it goes up to, still up to about 10 to the fourth Kelvin in the accretion disk, so they are quite hot still. But we also still lack a lot of cooling mechanisms. So now we have this one, uh, this H1 cooling that works efficiently in this disk to make sure the temperature gets low enough to form this accretion disk, but we know that if we include more cooling, things might still change. So um, that's also why you have to be careful interpreting, if you interpret all these results, like the radius and mass, that might still change if we have more cooling. Um, but I focus mostly on what happens if you change, for example, the wind velocity. Um, but like one thing we lack is molecular cooling, which, which will cool down the wind further out from the accretion disk, but it will still also impact the accretion disk. So we know there's still things that might cool down the disk. Hey, Yulin, very nice Hello. presentation. Um, about the WR140, one, one of the yeah. results that were quite impressive was um, how many shells actually were observed in Mary. So from the ground, we could only see two or three of those shells, mm -hmm. but with, in, in space with the shells, so we saw like 18 or something. You can go even fainter than that image. Yeah. Um, and so the point here was that the basically a lot of that stuff was expected to be destroyed by the interstellar radiation field and all that. So my question regarding your simulations is, how far could I go out and still mm -hmm. see those arcs? I guess, I guess it's all idealistic, so they never quite dissipate. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it's, I think it's, in that sense it's different, because we observe um, the stars still just with, with ALMA, yeah. and with ALMA you um, study different molecules, so the line that is most useful to see the density is the CO221 rotational line. And yeah. then um, what determines how far you see is the dissociation of CO, so okay. from the radiation outwards. So in this case, it was, I think we could only see at most three or four of okay. these concentric shells just because we look at CO and CO vanishes there. So yeah. that is what determines now. Oh, I see. So, uh, yeah, okay. I, I Th thanks. Yeah, that, I was okay. wondering about that. Yeah, thank you. All right. I believe we are at the hour, so uh, feel free to discuss with Yolene afterwards, after lunch or during lunch. Thanks, Yolene, again. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Yes. See you next time.